Hey, I'm Hans Hess. Thanks for watching my television program. Such a blessing, such an honor to come to you and preach the Word of God. I have a fire in my heart to win as many people to Jesus as I can before I leave here. I feel like the house is on fire and I'm trying to rescue folks out of the fire. So thanks for watching today. We're going to get into the scripture and I want you to open up your mind and open up your heart. Take just a few minutes and listen to what I have to say and allow God to speak to you today. Believe God. Elevate your faith today as you listen and believe God for great things. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. We're going to talk about Bethlehem this morning. Last week I began a series called Wonder and I talked about Jesus being the light of the world and I used that word light, L-I-G-H-T, as an acronym and I used each of those letters talking about why Jesus came and how uh, he came to let us know what God was like to inform us of God's plan on and on and on. And so today I'm going to talk about why Jesus came again, but I'm going to center it on the wonder of him coming to Bethlehem. Why in the world did he choose Bethlehem? Why Bethlehem? And Bethlehem's so close to Jerusalem. The last time we were in Jerusalem, we were at uh, the, the excavations, they think of David's house. King David's house, just right at kind of at the base of the hill where Mount Zion was. So I really got a perspective because when David built the tabernacle and temple, he just built it in his backyard. He just looked up on the hill behind his house, and that's where he built it. But standing on that hill, I could look and see the hills of Bethlehem. That's how close it is. So I want us to look this morning in Matthew chapter 2 and read this entire passage. It's 12 verses here about that wonderful day. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. These are the Magi. Saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them, where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, listen, they're not going back to Scripture, Old Testament Scripture. They said, well, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not the last or least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. And when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Can the church say amen? amen. We don't know how old Jesus was at this time when the Magi came. Uh, but they found the young child with his mother. You know, we have manger scenes that show the, sh the kings or the, the magi from the east standing around uh, the, the manger, but that's probably not what happened. They came sometime later when he was a little bit older by the time they found him. But nonetheless, really fascinating. So why Bethlehem? I think it reveals three things about Jesus. Why Bethlehem? I think it reveals three things. Number one, it reveals that he would be humble. Jesus wasn't born in the palaces of Rome, in the finest houses of Jerusalem. He wasn't born with pomp and circumstance. He evidently wasn't born to a wealthy family. He was born in kind of obscurity. 
born in a manger where they would keep the sheep and the beasts of the field at night. And that's how he was born. So he didn't come into this earth as you would think the king of all eternity should come into this earth. That he should come in with great praise and celebration. But he came in as a lowly servant. If you look into the book of Isaiah, there's a section of, of, of chapters there they call the servant songs. And they're chapters about a coming Messiah who would come. And what's interesting is that his coming doesn't seem to be as it should. Not with great circumstance and pomp and accolades and praise and parades and music and but that he was going to come as a servant. So when God came to earth, he didn't come and say, I'm going to show off my godness, all of my power, all of my glory, blow everybody away with the, my, the might of my power and light and flashings and thunders. And No, he didn't do that. He said, but I'm going to come in humility. No wonder Paul could admonish the Philippians in chapter 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who though being in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but humbled himself and came down to earth in the form of a servant and even humbled himself to death. So he came in humility so he could show us really what life should look like. He came in humility to really show us how a godly person should approach life. Yeah, I could sit here all day. Because we're human beings, I think we're fascinated by, uh, it, yeah, okay, so yesterday I, I, I came home Friday, but uh, my daughter Sarah and her husband stayed up there another day, and she sent me a, a picture where a good friend of mine lives in New York and said, hey, Dad, this is where Taylor Swift lives. And sent a picture of like her, whatever she has, a house or a townhome or a con, whatever, whatever the thing is. And uh, it's cool to see those things. We like to see those things, Right. I mean, come on, I'm going to break down and confess to y'all right here in a holiness church. I did visit Elvis's house. <laughs> I took my mom. We went to get our girl, my girls in Tulsa, and we were coming back, and my mom, and I was like, man, I grew up on Elvis, and my mom, I got to take her to Elvis's home. So it was, I've been to the jungle room. We, what, we like to see things like that as human beings, don't we? But you know, when God came, He didn't come with all this fame and power and accolades. He came as a servant. Came as a servant. This is what Bethlehem, it's the wonder of Bethlehem. It's what it speaks. Humility. Coming into the earth and taking a servant's form. Even if you remember the, the, the setting where Jesus was. Jesus knelt down with towel and basin and was getting ready to wash the disciples' feet, which was a real act of humility. And Peter said, no, no way. You're not washing my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no part with me. Peter said, then wash my head and face and everything. <laughs> Just do it all, Lord. He, the king of the universe knelt down and washed their feet. Not only that, Jesus reached out to people who were on the margins of society, who weren't accepted in the mainstream. He heals lepers. He ministers to Gentiles. He even tells two Gen he even marvels at two Gentiles and their great faith. One is a centurion servant, and the other is a Syrophoenician woman. Not only that, he goes to the country of the Gadarenes, which was a Gentile area, and casts out demons. Not only that, he has women in his following. Not only that, one of them had been delivered and had demons cast out of her. Not only that, when he rose from the dead, he chose women to be the first ones to carry the good news. 
It's, what, it's an upside down kingdom. No wonder he taught us. He said, if you want to be first, be the servant of all. Do unto others. All of the Sermon on the Mount is a flipped upside down kingdom. It's not the way you would think we should teach things in business. Be first. Get out ahead of everybody. Run over everybody. But even business, even business teaching now has understood servant leadership. And there's many books on servant leadership and stuff, how it works in the business. Even, uh, even the book uh, Jim Collins wrote, From Good to Great, which is a great business book, by the way. It, it was amazing once they did a study of all these great businesses in America, they found out that one of the outstanding characteristics of all these CEOs who pastored, who, who uh, oversaw great businesses was that they walked in a certain level of humility. When asked how they accomplished all that, they said, well, I got great people around me. It's the people to help me build this. They didn't take to the credit themselves. It was a certain humility. Why? Because it works. It works. It's how God taught us to live. You have to think about it. Bethlehem was the city where Ruth, who was a Moabitess, came back to with her mother-in-law Naomi, and she was accepted as a foreigner. Talk about humility and on the outside. She was accepted as a foreigner. And if you read the genealogy of Matthew, in Matthew's genealogy in chapter 1, there's all these heroes of the Old Testament faith. And then there are four women who appear in the genealogy. One of them is Ruth. Another one was Bathsheba. Another one was Tamar who disguised herself as a prostitute. Another one was Rahab, who was a prostitute. No hands raised, but how many of y'all have some skeletons in your family closet? I think what the writer Matthew was showing is a humble way of looking at this. Even in the genealogy of Jesus, there's some redemption that had to happen. Even in the genealogy of Jesus, there are some Gentiles that show up, and it shows me that God can take anybody and make somebody out of them. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. God can take anybody and make somebody out of them. And so to start the process, Jesus came and took the low road and came as a humble servant coming to serve others. And throughout his ministry, he would be tempted to take the other road in the, in the wilderness when he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights at the first of his ministry. Satan came to him and tempted him. And he basically wanted him to take the power of God and display it. Just to show it off. Just show who you are. Turn this rock into bread. Cast yourself down from the temple. But Jesus wouldn't do it. That's not why he came. He didn't come to just show off his power for no purpose. And Satan wanted him to take a shortcut. Not walk the road of humility, but take a shortcut. He said, okay, finally, okay, this is the final deal. If you'll just fall down and worship me, all these kingdoms of the world will be yours. Jesus said, no way. No way. You shall serve the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. I'm not bowing down to you. Jesus took the road of humility. Later on, John chapter 6. Oh, listen to this. This is so powerful. I've preached this before, but listen to it again. John chapter 6, when Jesus turns the, the little boy's lunch, He prays over it, and it turns into enough to feed 5,000. All the people, John said, were desiring to make Him king. At that point, when they saw that miracle, they're like, oh my gosh, let's make him king right now. Let's have the inauguration deal right now. And when Jesus heard that, it was another temptation for him to take a shortcut, to get off an exit ramp from the road of humility and become a king right then. And what did he do? The Bible said he dispersed the crowds and he put the disciples in a boat and sent them across the sea. And he went to the mountain to be alone with the Father. Because he wasn't going to take that way. He was going to take the road of humility. Two, let me give you two more. In Caesarea Philippi, Matthew chapter 16, he tells the disciples what must happen to him. And Peter stands up and says, no, Lord, it can't be that way. You can't go to Jerusalem and be crucified like that. Surely not. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Just a few verses before that, he had that revelation. 
that he knew that this was the Messiah. And Jesus said, man, great job. The Father has shown you this. But then after that, Peter thought it was going to happen in a different way. Let's take an exit ramp. Let's go right now and make you king right now. Let's go to Jerusalem right now and take it over. And Jesus stops him and he says, get behind me. He recognized the spirit that was tempting him to not take the road of humility. One more. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying. And then in his flesh, he feels this temptation again. He feels this struggling. I could just walk out of this garden right now, and I could just take an exit ramp, and I could not walk this road of humility. I could leave this road of suffering behind, and everything would be okay. But then he breaks down and he says, Father, but not my will but thine be done. What does Bethlehem represent? It represents that the king of all the universe came in ultimate humility to you and me so he could relate to us and give his life for us. Can somebody shout hallelujah? What's the second thing that Bethlehem represents? Bethlehem is where we get the story of the kinsman redeemer. Bethlehem is where Ruth came back with her mother-in-law having lost her husband, having lost her brother-in-law, and lost her father-in-law, they came back evidently broke, with evidently at the point of starvation, and they came back into the city. And what happened? Naomi, the mother-in-law, knew Jewish law, and that if she could find a husband for Ruth, that they'd all be taken care of. And she knew the law, and that she needed to find someone who was kin to her son, and her husband's family because that's the way the Jewish law worked. Aren't you glad it doesn't work that way today? Yeah. Hallelujah. So anyhow, she had to find someone in the family. She said, now, now Ruth, I know a guy. His name is Boaz. And what I want you to do is I want you to go down to Sephora and use what little bit of money you have and trick yourself out, <laughs> then since we can't afford much, we're going to go over to TJ Maxx and get the outfit. <laughs> and then I'm going to help you get fixed up, and you're going to go down to his field, and you're going to ask if you can glean in his field. And she goes down there, and it works out. She gleans in his field, and she catches his eye. And there's a story that goes on. We debated about it years ago in Hebrew class as to what actually went on, but evidently they kind of fell for each other at one point, and we'll leave it right there. But Boaz knew the family, and he says, oh my gosh, now i got to do something. Oh, Lord. Okay, hold on. There's one guy that's closer in kin than me. I'm going to go meet him in the morning. So he goes down to the city gates where all the guys hung out, you know, and he goes down there, and he meets this guy, and he bargains for Ruth. He gets the privilege of marrying Ruth, comes back, marries Ruth. At the end of the book, they're sitting there so happy. We don't hear about Ruth anymore. We hear about Naomi. She's there holding the baby Obed that Ruth had had by Boaz, and everything was redeemed, and all the women of the village now were praising Naomi. Why? Because Obed would have a son named Jesse who would have a son named David who would become the king of Israel. Why is that book in the Bible? It's, it's for that purpose. It's to show us where David was going to come from. So when Jesus came to Bethlehem, I think it just speaks something of the kinsman redeemer power that God was sending to planet earth. Now here's what happened in the kinsman redeemer thing. It comes from the Hebrew term goel, which means to redeem. And it was to be, the in Hebrew, the nearest male blood relative alive. And this is what the kinsman redeemer could do. Number one, if anyone was in poverty and unable to redeem their inheritance, it was the duty of the kinsman redeemer to come and redeem the inheritance for someone who was in poverty. That's a great opportunity to shout, but I'm going to go ahead. The kinsman redeemer was also required to redeem a relative 
who had sold himself into slavery. It's a second opportunity to shout, but I'm going to go on. And the kinsman redeemer was also the avenger of blood. In the case that there was a murder, he was the one who was to go out and take vengeance and make sure the blood price was paid for. I don't know about you, but my Jesus came to redeem me from the poverty of sin and a sin-cursed world. I ain't poor no more. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but Jesus came to redeem me from the slavery of sin and from the bondages that I knew as a sinner, and I ain't bound anymore. Come on, can somebody shout hallelujah? And Jesus came as the blood kinsman redeemer to pay a blood price for me that no man could pay, no angel could pay, no seraphim could pay, no other terrestrial being could pay, but only the Son of God could give his life and shed his blood for the remission of sins. And now I'm standing before you, not perfect, but blood washed and sanctified and Holy Ghost filled and redeemed with a price and bought back from hell and bought back from destruction because I had a great kinsman redeemer come all the way from heaven to earth and redeem me out of sin. Come on, somebody. Put your hands together and give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo, I could stay there all morning. Come on, just lift your hand and say, thank God for the kinsman redeemer. Boaz is a type and shadow of Jesus who would come in the future. you got to think, Ruth and Naomi were completely obliterated. They lost their husbands and they came back broke as could be. And they came back and a kinsman redeemer wiped away all the shame, wiped away all the poverty, and brought them back into a respectable inheritance. Even the inheritance of their dead husbands redeemed through the kinsman redeemer. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody say third thing. Third thing I think Bethlehem represents the wonder of it all is Bethlehem was the city of the king. And it speaks that he would not only be a kinsman redeemer, but he would be the king and the Messiah that all of Israel had been waiting on. 1 Samuel chapter 17, the Bible talks about David. David was from Bethlehem. It's to the city of Bethlehem that Samuel the prophet went looking for the next king of Israel. And you remember the story if you've read the Bible that he comes to Jesse, whose grandmother was Ruth. Think about that. The prophet comes down to Jesse and he says, bring out your sons. They were scared. When they saw Samuel come to town, the whole town was fearful because they knew he's the man of God. Mess with him, people die. And so he came into the house and then Jesse brings out all of his sons. And, and Samuel, even Samuel doesn't know. He just knows he's where he's supposed to be. And so he sees the firstborn and he's like tall and he's got the build and he's the oldest and he's got it all going on. And Samuel says, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. And he walks up to him and he gets a no. So he goes to the next one. Surely this is the Lord's anointed. And he gets a no. And he, and he keeps on going down. And then he comes to the last and he gets a no as well. And he looks at Jesse. He's like, do you have any more kids? Well, well there's one. <laughs> Why was he not invited to the party? Going, you think you've been left out? Why was he not invited? That puzzles me. So yeah, call him in. He's watching the sheep. And they call in David, the youngest of the brothers. And they called him in. And the Spirit of the Lord came on him. And the Spirit spoke to Samuel and said, The Lord's anointed is before you. And he takes the horn of oil and he pours it on his head. And the Bible says from that day forward, the Spirit of God rested on David. If you read the next few verses, the Spirit of the Lord left Saul. There's a pivot in the book of Samuel. It's absolutely amazing. The Spirit of the Lord comes on Samuel and leaves from Saul. That day, in that humble little town of Bethlehem, 
the king, the greatest king of Israelite history, the one that they looked for coming, a type of him coming again, for, the, for hundreds of years, he was anointed in that little town. So no wonder when Jesus was born, he's described 17 times in the New Testament as the son of David. 17 times as the son of David. When he comes, Jesus is the promised Messiah. The term Messiah is just from the Hebrew, Hebrew uh, Moshiach, which means to anoint. He is the one who is the anointed one. As David was the anointed one with the oil poured out on him, Jesus is the anointed one who stepped into the river Jordan and the Holy Spirit was poured out on him. The Bible just tells us he received it without measure. So Jesus is the promised Messiah, which means he had to be of the lineage of David. And Matthew 1 gives us the genealogical proof that Jesus in his humanity was a direct descendant of Abraham and David through Joseph. This is why Joseph is so important to the story. Praise God. Thank you for listening today and thank you for opening up your heart to hear the Word of God. Listen, I want to pray for you quickly before we go off the air here. If you have any needs in your life or if you've never accepted Christ into your heart, I really want to see you make it to heaven. I want to see you finish this race well. Amen? God has provided the greatest gift of all history. That is, He gave us His Son that, who would die for us so that we wouldn't have to face eternity without God. So if you've never accepted Christ into your heart, Let's start there today. Then I'm going to pray for healing and other needs in your life. So just pray this with me. Father, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. Forgive me of all sin and become the Lord of my life, Lord Jesus. In your name I pray. Now I'm going to pray for your needs. Father, in the name of Jesus, for those who are struggling in their bodies, struggling in their minds, Lord, I pray that you minister to them right now. I pray that you touch them by the power of your Holy Spirit. We bind every demonic influence in their life that's attacking them and we cast it out and we just declare the glory of God and victory of God in their hearts right now in the name of Jesus. Be set free by the power of God. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you for watching us. Go in victory and give God the praise. Gonna come. Look straight ahead, my face towards the sun.